Hi everyone, this is Bob Dietrich with the ADHD Toolbox. And we are um, here with Michelle Raz today. Michelle is uh, an uh, educator uh, and she's B BCC board certified B uh, CSS career service specialist. She's an author, she's a blogger, she's a podcast host, and she does a ton of stuff. And, and our focus today is going to be on education, um, especially the transition uh, from high school to college. Michelle, welcome to our program. Thanks for being uh, our guest today. Thank you for having me today. All right. Well, I'm, I'm excited to talk to you because uh, at the end of this, this talk, we're gonna, you're going to give us 10 strategies every kid uh, needs to be successful in college, right? Making that transition, especially kids with ADHD. And, um, uh, and we're going to talk about that today. Uh, and we're talking about some of the skills that, that you're going to need because if you have executive function challenges, right, there can be some big challenges in making this huge transition from, you know, from um, uh, high school to college, especially if you're moving out of state, right? I, mean, mm -hmm. I can imagine that it's already <clears throat> difficult if you're just in high school, right, and you're moving from a new, a new high school you know, and you're in the same state, maybe in the same city, if you move from to a different state uh, or a different environment, that's going to be challenging. But going, you know, to college, out of state, new, everything's new. It's just going to, and, and, and you got ADHD and you're young, it's just going to be chaos, uh, potentially. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so we're going to talk to you about that today. So thank you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Because your bio is is substantial and uh which is awesome that's what we want uh and uh what's the short version how did you get involved with adhd oh great this is my story and um, yeah. we all have stories of why we find our passion and purpose in life and usually when it hits home into the heart that means that you're really going to be putting a lot of effort and focus around it and i came to um ADHD coaching for my daughter who was struggling in school and at the time there was not a lot of resources for her in being a previous educator I knew that she could succeed that she would do well but she just needed some support around that so I was researching for her found ADHD coaching at the time there were no other coaches and so I got trained and I've been coaching ever since so it's very near and dear to me that's my start to it and it went from working with high school college students to um, working with the students when they graduated college and finding a career for them also adults that come in and maybe want to go back to college and they struggle with executive function challenges or somebody that wants to redefine their career that they didn't quite get a good match up the first time around so my clientele has grown exponentially which spurred me to want to write a book along with a mentor that i was working with and then from there other things have just kind of smoke snowballed from there with blogging and um, doing podcasts as well that's great what's the name of your book i'm um, happiness passion and purpose got it now it sounds like what we're going to talk about today you know although we're talking about the transition from high school mm -hmm. to college um, it sounds like it's the, what, the things we're going to talk about today are, are totally relevant really with any transition from mm -hmm. college to career, from career to new career, um, from being married to being divorced, from, <laughs> you know, all sorts of different transitions that are possible. Is that, is that uh, going to be apl applicable in those areas as well? You know, let's just face it, when you have executive function challenges, it can come from a lot of different sources. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we think of ADHD as the hallmark of deficits with our executive functions, mm -hmm. but it can be stress induced, it, it can be age related, it, it can be uh, just a myriad of different ways of how we struggle. And even on a day to day basis, uh, a neurotypical person can struggle with some of these. Um, executive functions. And so, yes, these can be applied to anybody, but specifically if you know you're challenged with those eight executive functions, and I can go over those really quickly. Um, and just as a reminder to everybody, we, we know that a lot of the challenges are um, with impulse control 
organization time management, but we also really at the top of it, when I'm working with people, I talk about emotional control. And so just like you're saying, if there are other factors going on in people's lives and their emotional regulation is off, there's going to be triggers that will affect their ability to control some impulses, to be flexible in their thinking, which is another of the executive functions. Probably the working memory is a little weak. Um, Self-monitoring, just knowing how you're doing, planning, prioritizing, and then being accountable for yourself and getting things done. And so these areas can really be applicable to many people. Awesome. So definitely you're going to be able to use this in, in, in um, <clears throat> different transitions, but we're going to talk specifically about college, uh, the transition from high school to college. And so we have an idea of uh, an, an example of how we can use it. So let's dig in and um, start to unpack this a little bit. So let's start with the question of how does a student with executive function challenges navigate the demands of academics at the college level? Right. I mean, remember, transitions are difficult for anybody, right, in our lives as we're moving through, but especially difficult when you have challenges with executive functions. Mm -hmm. So the excitement of the college, being independent, and, you know, allowing that student, that client to structure their own time with their academics and social life can be very challenging. And so um, as a parent, you know, you generally, you have spent many years navigating a support system for your student. And just when you're feeling you finally got it and you have all the resources in place, boom, you're trying to figure out how they're gonna do this in college without that safety net. Um, it's exciting, it's also scary and parents are just full of worry and, and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. I have a funny story about my own self. I've got a second to talk, talk about it. Um, when, when my first um, daughter, who is my uh, reason why I came about doing this, when she went away to college, I went with her, right? And, and I went into the parent meetings and the dean of the, the college was there and he was doing the big lecture. And the next step after we learned about the campus and all the different resources and activities was to go register for the classes. And so when he said, okay, now's the time to go register, he knew what was going to happen and I was just as guilty as anybody else and I was already doing my ADHD academic coaching. We all stood up with our students, with our kids, and we wanted to go with them. And he stopped us and said, parents, your child is going to college. You will sit here and we will talk to you and they are going to go register for their classes. Brilliant. <laughs> I love that. I stopped dead in my tracks and I thought, okay, you got me and you know i'm right there with all the other parents worried how can they do this by themselves mm -hmm. i you know they can they even pick out a course mm -hmm. so yes they um they can do it on their own the colleges recognize that a lot of students need extra help and they have resources in place for them and so when i'm working with the college students and we start to break down this fear I start with some one thing, the very first thing, and, and I can go on to more, but I'm going to give you this one thing just first of all, is every student needs to be their own advocate, right? When they were in high school, they had their parents. They had probably, um, if they were on an IEP um, or even the 504, they had a resource person helping them navigate the system giving them the tools and telling them the steps to get there. Mm -hmm. You don't have that at the college level so readily available. You have it as a resource and they are there, but you need to be your own advocate. You need to learn to communicate what you need and be able to go and find that and be that person that's going to actually get up and walk over and talk to somebody. So number one, how, how does this be, how can you be successful is to start by the student being their own advocate. Got it. Got it. And what a valuable tool for life 
also right. being your own advocate and standing up for yourself, um, make, doing your own plans um, and really kind of making that happen. So awesome. And, uh, and I'll just add on to this is that the high school does a nice job. I, I know that when the freshmen come into the um, high school, Mm -hmm. And the parents are very used to um, sending the teachers emails and, and walking and talking to the um, teachers. And very quickly, they start to pull back and they want that student to be emailing them and whatnot. So they do try to prep them. But when you have a student that struggles with executive challenges, um, you tend to overstep that boundary a little bit. And you, uh, a lot of times you can make excuses. Well, if if I don't do this, or if I don't make sure this happens, if I don't follow up with that resource teacher, I know my student is not going to do this. And so a lot of times it's a collaboration with the parent, the resource teachers, and they're there trying to get the student to be self advocating, independent, but they tend to have more of a lean back, a lean somebody to go to a fallback. Um, as they go to college and that can that transition of being really you have nobody there um, is it can be startling for a lot of parents and students that are used to that yeah <clears throat> yeah I bet I bet and and um, uh, so does your book cover that uh, information um, um, no, in the, in the book, I am looking about how to find a career that speaks to your passion and your purpose. Oh, I got it, got it. Yeah, so it, it's more about, you know, what, what your pathway is going to be than um, their survival skills. <laughs> I could do a whole other book on that one. Probably. I bet you could, probably a volume. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so, so from, a, from a structural standpoint, uh, certainly difficult change because all the structure that they had in high school is changed. It's, uh, some of it's gone, some of it's different titles, uh, some of it they just simply have to be their own advocate. For example, the counselor, right? Their counselors aren't going to come to you in, high, in, in college like they did in high school. And yeah. they write out your um, IEP or 504. So, uh, so you need to be your own advocate. You need to take, um, and, uh, take advantage. Is there anything that, that parents can do while the kid is in high school to prepare them for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is a weaning process. Mm -hmm. it, it could be a weaning process, right? Yes, <laughs> unless, right. Unless you're yeah. not prepared and then you just throw them into college, then there's, then it's just the truncated process. <laughs> right. And I got to say that I was a little on the guilty side of that myself. And I learned real quick. And so I have three kids and, and my last one's much more independent. Um, and it was, a, it's been a weaning process because when you have a student that has a disability and you're constantly used to being their advocate through the school system, mm -hmm. and especially if you have a school system that isn't recognizing your students because it's kind of an invisible disability, right? They look good, they act good, they might be athletic, they're smart. Um, but you know these weaknesses and you are advocating for the teachers and using the resources because that's what you do. Um, so it's very easy to be there too much for them. Mm -hmm. But remember, and that we're placing a lot of value on learning through failure, right? And what better way to do it in those high school years and do it in baby steps where it's intentional. Mm -hmm. You know that they're probably not gonna get to that counselor to pick that class that they should take. I mean, as parent, you know what they should do. And you, you just step back and let them fail and not have the class, or do you bypass them to go to the resource? So pick and choose the areas where you can have these smaller failures so they can learn from them and then they can you know be a little bit more prepared along the way. And of course, organizing, planning, and routines are huge for people with executive function challenges. And so if you can start a routine and have a procedure of how to do something and have that through the high school years, it'll be much easier on them when they do get to college. Fantastic. So, um, so from a standpoint of uh, structure, you know, we talked about that. From, what about an, from the academic side, from, you know, you're learning studying textbooks, you know, the real learning, they're in class, um, maybe they're even picking out their classes. Is there, uh, are there challenges around that that, that you, they need to be prepared for? 
Yes, I mean, you, you actually just said about three things that I could speak to. Um, so let's see, where do I want to start with? Let's talk about learning. And um, let's say listening for learning. Um, because one time, when you're a freshman and you're just starting out in college, a lot of the times you're going to have to take some classes that aren't really yet to your interests, unless you've taken some classes, AP classes in high school and you get to bypass English or math or, and, or whatnot. But generally, those are going to be your strength areas and there's going to be a few requirements that you just have to get through. So how do you do that? You're independent. You don't have that tutor back at home. You don't have uh, the parents monitoring. You have all this free time, distractions of a social life potentially, or just worry. And so picking classes smartly is my biggest um, advice and times of day. And so be strategic on when you can best handle a class that's going to be difficult. Um, in high school, sometimes you didn't have very many choices if you were at a smaller high school and you had to take math at eight o'clock in the morning. And you, it's all you could do is just to get to class in time when maybe an art class would have been better at that time of day. And you could have taken math at 11 or 12 or, or maybe you're a night person and you come to um, come out at night and that's when you do your best work. So knowing yourself so that you can be the most present that you can be. It's not going to be easy, especially if it's a course that's a requirement and it's not something that you are naturally drawn to. And we could go down, you know, what that is, that, that focus and that attention is going to be harder. So set yourself up for success by knowing when the class is best for you. Then Use the resources of the colleges. Check out what people say about professors. Usually you're going to have a few variations of professors. The formats, some um, of the classes offer different formats. So when you start to get into the academics, you need to kind of consider all these pieces of the puzzle and then put them together and get the best situation for you. And it's not going to be perfect. Um, very rarely is it. But you can set yourself up externally so that when you get into that class, you've got a good chance of doing well in it. And then we can talk about other things when you're in the class, you know, the listening techniques, the note taking. Right. Studying habits, scheduling, things like that. Right. Awesome. Great stuff. Okay. So, uh, so we talked about the structure. We talked about the academics. Now let's move into the social because, you know, social uh, being social and the social life in college um, for neurotypical kids is like that's what college is all about right <laughs> uh, and but for ADHD kids it might be a little different it might be super scary what, what's it like for them and and mm -hmm. what can they do to um, grow from this process exactly you know just has um, ADHD has so many different components to it and people struggle in different areas of ADHD. So the clients that I see that come to me are very across the board different. You'll have some that are so excited for that college experience and they're jumping right in and it's just one you know, social event after another social event. They're joining every club, they're working out. They've got so, they're having so much fun that we're like, okay, we need to sit you down and get some study, you know, blocks of time here. Let's start some structure and some planning. And so you've got that kind of student. And then you have the ones that might be intimidated with the social scene. They've got some struggles with interpersonal skills and they're very cautious and they don't come out of their dorm rooms enough. Mm. And they're the ones that need that social life. And so you're trying to get them to join clubs. You're trying to get them to socialize with people mm. down the hallway. So you really have two different types of personalities. So when I'm working with them, we're, we look at the overall goal for that semester for them, taking in what do the parents also want from them. But as a student, they kind of know themselves. They know what they want to get out of it. So start with that social. and then back off about how how is the academics going to fit into that or if it's somebody who's antisocial or not really antisocial let's just say a little on the shyer side maybe a little bit of an introvert it is more about okay you're, you've got your study blocks of time how can we get you out of the dorm room and start to meet some people that have like interest on campus so it, it's a balance between that social and the academics and it can go either way 
Got it. So everybody's different. You got to really customize that for your child. Is there anything the parent can do to help um, with the with the social? Yeah. yeah. So be the summer before, um, if I'm working with somebody transitioning just straight from high school, um, first year college, we will start to back off um, to if somebody's anxious we will back off about a month ahead of time and start to set up small mini goals. Look at the campus. Where are your classes at, at a, on a map if you can't go there in person? And then start to look at the different clubs, the different resources. Get to know that college website. And I can't believe how many students will come to me maybe a month or two or three into the semester and they don't know the campus. They don't know what the offerings are. They have no idea what the clubs are. And so I give them a little homework and we start with some of those. If you can do it before college starts, you're going to get a much more interested, receptive student, especially if they're on the shyer side, because they can sometimes, you know, transitions with students with executive function challenges are difficult when they happen all at once. And so if you can ease into it, that's good. Now, on the flip side, if you have somebody that's just gung ho and ready to go, you might limit them and have an opportunity to parent or mentor them about, you know, how realistic is it for you to draw, join six clubs? You know, you know, what do you think would be realistic that first semester? And start to put that on to the student to start to think through the schedule a little bit, the demands of the academics, and slow them down maybe a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, so we've, we've talked about these, these uh, three areas, the structure, the academics, the social. Is there a balance that needs to happen with, with these three, or um, how does that work? Yeah, exactly. Um, very rarely will I have somebody that I'm working with that comes in and has that social and academic balance. And so, again, going back to what I just mentioned is really, if you put that on to the student to talk about what do they want out of their first semester, first year, or even the whole college experience, like especially if they're wanting to join a sorority or a fraternity, and talking about the demands of the academics. And there's a lot of information the college puts out there for students' expectations of how much work they need to do for how many classes they're taking. Mm -hmm. And so there's a balance. Now, this is a good topic as anybody in college needs to have a balance. But with executive function challenges, if you are a slow processor and you know it's going to take you longer to do the work, um, you need to factor that time. And is it, do you have time for one club or a fraternity or sorority or even working to get income coming in for yourself and, and just looking at that time and managing it out in probably a month out at a time and see where you have time for social and hopefully your academic is first. Yeah. If you're a student that is a quick processor and you need activity, maybe you should join an intramural sport because some students just do better when they're very busy and they're very structured. Um, and then the others that maybe be a slow processor need a different kind of activity because mm -hmm. I do believe they all need them, right. but they need to be able to not be stressed because they need more time to process this new knowledge that they're gaining. Got it, got it. So um, it seems to me that there must be some academic clubs out there too, where where they're study groups or they're focused on a certain subject. And those seems like you can maybe kill two birds with one stone. You got the social group that's actually, you're mm -hmm. learning about the topic that you're on or whatever. Is that, is that existing college nowadays? That's a great question. So just recently I have a student and he's an extremely talented gaming computer um, engineer, I, I guess is what you call it. Um, but part of his goal is to become more social. Mm. And so we have been working on finding clubs and he did find a club that actually integrates the gaming component with some development, so it's good academic, and he's got a social network going along with it. So, the, and they didn't even realize that his college had that kind of a club. And they meet once a week; they have events. So, yes, absolutely, everybody can find a club, a sport that suits their needs. And um, 
it's really wild how many different clubs there are. And there are students that start their own clubs. Oh, there you go. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. All right. Well, there's so much here uh, that can be done, but really it's, it's a matter of jumping in. Um, you don't want to, you know, hold the, as a parent, you don't want to hold the kid too tight. Um, but you also want to make sure that they uh, have what they need. Uh, so it sounds like being prepared, um, uh, making sure they know the website, making sure they, they know the college campus, at least the map, if, if they can visit it even better, um, get them familiar, do it a couple times, get them familiar with it. And then, um, uh, and then just kind of, you know, mentor them along the way up after that. So uh, I think that's it kind of sums it up and, um, you know, they'll get what they get and, and they'll do just fine as long as you can <laughs> give them, give them the tools they need to, to, to be successful. That's, so that's great. All right. So tell us about your, your free gift, your, your 10 strategies. Every college kid needs to be successful. What is, what's in, in that specific, uh, a download? Yeah, so I um, put together 10 strategies, and, and there's a whole lot more, but I, I kind of picked the top 10 and kind of in a sequence, and I went over some of them today, you know, and that is um, some strategies that everybody can benefit by doing in college, whether or not you have ADHD, but it's just a systematic approach with a couple of suggestions of things that you can do um, within each one. And then today I talked about the number one, being your best advocate for yourself, that communication, that mom and dad aren't going to be there for you, that you need to be contacting your professors, emailing them on your own. Um, and then I go into some other specific strategies, especially with executive function challenges, that if you implement these, that you are going to set yourself up for success. Now, you have to do the work, and that, that's the thing, but if you have these external structures in place that you don't have to worry about, that then when it comes down to the actual brain power and studying, and I do have some tricks on that as well, that you're gonna be better set up for success. That's awesome. That's awesome. So make sure that you click the link below. It's going to take you to uh, Michelle's free download and uh, the 10 strategies. Every college kid needs to be successful. Uh, you definitely want to check that out. Check out Michelle's website as well, razcoaching.com, and you'll get more information there. Uh, Michelle, thank you so much for being a part of the toolbox. It's great information. And uh, certainly uh, for any parent having a kid in high school, uh, uh, getting ready to college to go to college it's super important but you know any transition really uh, knowing that it's coming making sure that you visit making sure that you do all these things I think um, that we talked about uh, can really help uh, with with any transition so awesome stuff thank you so much yes I hope you get value out of it thank you yeah thank you and thank you all for watching this episode of the ADHD toolbox we will see you on the next episode